My name is Dorian. Dorian Sagan. Sagan. Okay, and what do you do? Um, I'm an eclectic dilettante. An eclectic dilettante? I, oh, yeah. All right. And uh, now you have a rock there. Yes. And I've noticed that that's a dead thing, and you're a, you're a life form, aren't you? I pass well for one, usually. You pass for one, usually. And is there any time you haven't passed for one? Mm, maybe when I was hiding in my bed trying to be... Uh, no, I guess I usually... I don't know. I'm... I, um, wait, wait. Hamper. You wrote a book called What is Life? So you should know, right? Yeah, yeah, I should. Well, so tell us about what you what life is then. Well, and what is life? Um, it was a, it's sort of a poetic, philosophical, scientific meditation on what life is, which was treated by uh, Erwin Schrödinger, and um, before that, there's several books with that title now. But um, I think that was what was different about that book is it looked at the history of life and it embedded that into the definition and you know if you look at the etymology of definition it's to define it's to form a limit around something and that becomes difficult with life because life as an evolutionary process is not only changing and evolving um, phylogenetically but it's also expanding physically and people like um, um, Vladimir Vernadsky pointed out that over the course of evolutionary history, more and more chemical elements become involved in the process of life at Earth's surface. So you have actual ex expansion, not only of materials in space, but of the actual elements involved in the process that we call alive. So it makes it difficult to come up with a very ironclad definition of life. So it was really a meditation on an expanding evolutionary definition of life, and it looked at different definitions, and it talked about both the history of life and the diversity of life. Well, we're, we're uh, as an astronomer, and, and in this course, are we alone? We're interested in life elsewhere. Yeah. So you've already introduced a whole bunch of complications to even defining life on this planet. Right. So I imagine it's much harder to talk about life elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's problematic that we are so focused on um, the um, strange uh, occurrence of finding life elsewhere or of not finding life elsewhere and, and seeming so special as a result when there are, are an estimated 10 to 30 million species on the planet right now, 99 plus percent of which are actually extinct and that we can barely communicate often with members of our own species, let alone with others. So it begs the question of, if there was really radically different life, how would we know that we were communicating with them? How would, how, what, why, why does it make sense to think that it would be a, a simple matter to communicate with radically different life when we don't really communicate with other life forms on this planet, even the same way that we communicate with one another of our own species, our con specifics. And communicate, is that what we want to do? Communicate, that's, that's a little bit more sophisticated than just yeah. find it. Yeah, find it, yeah. So, but if, let's say if I wanted to find life elsewhere, you mm -hmm. know, then, uh, well, I'm wondering, have we already detected extraterrestrial life? I don't know, I don't know that that's, I mean, there, there are the, the wow, so you probably you know. No, I was wondering whether we we see stars and we could define them as oh. life forms if we wanted to, if we gen made a very well, well, generic I, version. Well, I mean, philosophically, the skeleton, the traditional skeleton in the closet of philosophy is solipsism. I don't have a direct experience of any other life form. It's a form of projection um, for me to even, you know. Um, be fully convinced that you are a life form with an inside the same way that I am. I do it on the basis of recognizing similarity in your appearance and through sort of social convention, but um, is there, um, oh, now I've lost my train of thought, I've lost my train of thought, but no, so, so when we find, when we look at things that are like us, when we look at things that um, behave as we do, the more they're like us, the more easy it is to identify with them, the more it is easy to believe that they are alive, but there becomes a certain um, limit when, you know, we are projecting our own internal feeling of being alive into other beings. And if we just look at the complexity and the sort of um, teleology of other beings, 
you could argue that things like stars uh, might be alive and science fiction writers have ex explored that theme and that's part of what you'll probably ask me about later on well, thermodynamics. Well, let's be a little bit more specific. Okay. And what if, if I gave you, I don't know, a hundred billion dollars and said, here's a hundred billion dollars, but the condition is you're going to help us, you have to spend this money to try to answer the question, are we alone? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Would you give it to a bunch of philosophers and try to figure out what life is and then j make the definition of life so large that you say, yeah, see, we've already defined, we've already found it, or would you invest it all in radio telescopes or what would you do? Maybe well, microscopes, looking for nano aliens, I don't know. Yeah, no, I would probably split it up into microscopes and telescopes, give some money to philosophy with enough money to keep them happy with alcohol and whatever other substances they needed to do their inner explorations. And then I'd probably take like a third of it, so we still have like $333 million left, and then give that to sort of um, the, you know, the extraterrestrial atmospheric chemists and see if they could find evidence of uh, redox sort of behaviors in outer life, uh, you know, the presence of oxygen and, um, and um, reducing compounds to see if there's a consistent non-equilibrium thermodynamic atmosphere that's similar, and I don't know if it would help to give them, usually when you pour money at problems, it doesn't necessarily help. Right, but, but so, that, so let me get this straight. So you think <laughs> that it's, there are biosignatures that can be un unambiguously well, identified with life? On other know, planets? I don't know about about. I mean, I'm really not an expert, but I, I, I and I don't think anybody is. I think there's huge problems with the whole, the whole question to me is more of a, a, a sort of a, a philosophical entertainment that allows you to be more interdisciplinary in your scientific explorations and has benefit for that reason, but as has been criticized of uh, the science, so-called of exobiology, later called astrobiology, it's a science without a subject, so, you know, um, but I think that um, as James, James Lovelock has um, suggested, if you were in outer space looking at Earth, you could detect from the atmosphere that it was away from thermodynamic equilibrium. It's not like Mars, it's not like Venus, it's not 90 plus percent carbon dioxide. It's actively creating compounds that should react with each other and come to equilibrium, and that suggests that there is surface life on the Earth. But there are other, uh, well, for example, volcanoes. They're not equilibrium, and they're not was necessarily usually not considered to be life forms. But they would produce gases that would be out of equilibrium, and that would be momentarily, but not. Well, they for got example, <laughs> oxygen and methane, which should react to carbon dioxide right. water for the last two billion years. I mean, so you might have to do a longer term experiment. Maybe you could set it up with some, you know, um, uh, long term mechanize some of the observations and do it over time to find uh, signatures of non-equilibrium chemistry. So you would take a third of this hundred billion dollars and use it to try to find biosignature gases out of equilibrium on the surfaces of Earth-like planets? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I thought that's what you would I'm, said. Well, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't attach much uh, courage to my own momentary convictions, but that seems reasonable. Okay. I mean, it would be, I would take. I would, it, would, it would. It seems like a lot of money to spend on that. But. Well, you were going to spend almost that much or as much on philosophers, and I've never heard anybody suggest that before in my entire yeah. life. Well, I like to mix it up. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, how about nano aliens? You said microscopes. Now, I've been trying to convince yeah. some of my yeah. microscopists to uh, to have a look at some of these things they throw away, and they say, yeah. "Oh, that's nothing. That's a piece of." I said, "How do you know what that is?" So, uh, what do you think of nano aliens? I thought it was intriguing that Richard Feynman wrote that paper about how much room lots there of room is at the bottom yeah. down there. Yeah, and that, and and I think that also is. Um, um, a theme that's been explored in some science fiction, and um, it doesn't seem impossible to me. When I think about the history of life on Earth and how it's not just what we've been stressing in mainstream evolutionary biology, the um, speciation of mammal-like organisms or larger macroorganisms, the traditional animals of paleontology, but it's also microbes, bacteria coming together to become eukaryote cells with nuclei, cells with nuclei coming together to become multicellular um, antecedents to the animals 
uh, to, to the organisms that would become um, fungi, plants, and animals, namely the protoctus, these nucleated cells, we see that the energy of the sun primarily is being used not only to spread and diversify over um, the surface of the earth, but it's also that same energy in the crowded condition, conditions of uh, a biochemically changing planet over evolutionary time is, is being used to concentrate life forms. And that suggests to me that the, the power of life that we see in the expansion of life from the oceans to the land and to the atmosphere and now flirting with outer space, that same energy is also being exercised in a downward fashion. And that to me suggests that that is a serious question of, of, of whether there, and we look at, you know, I think a mile under the surface there are um, chemolithotrophic life forms. So it's a serious question and, um, and probably one that I would probably spend about maybe like 50 to 100 million just checking that out. Now you, you trace the, uh, the evolution of life on this planet. You started talking about microbes and then eukaryotes. Now could you channel your mother, Lynn Margulis, and, and let me ask you this, you're Lynn now, do you think that those, those, that sequence of events that happened here, prokaryotes to eukaryotes, do you think that would happen somewhere else on other planets? Is that something that's so fundamental that we should expect it elsewhere? Um, Lynn. Oh, Lynn. You're Lynn now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, bro. Um, I think that, I think that um, if we are, and she probably wouldn't, use the word statistics, but um, if we look at it from like a probabilistic manner, we look at the number of life forms and the behaviors of life forms and get out of our sort of like anthropocentric, anthropomorphic frame of mind, we see that there's these open systems and that they're all life forms are these thermodynamic um, systems that are trading energy and matter with their surroundings and often genes in symbiosis. So I would say if life evolves or if life is spread, like as they imagine in, um, um, what is it called, um, panspermia, that life didn't necessarily evolve on Earth, but as people like Francis Crick said, has come through volcanoes and other things to different planets and is actually cycling through the universe, well then I think that would be a very likely scenario that you would see microbes forming higher levels of organization uh, uh, through the, the natural process, especially if, if uh, bacteria, for example, are cosmically common. Simon Conway Morris has talked about convergence, and he's said that multiple ind independent uh, origins of the eye, for example. Or uh, I just talked to uh, Andy Knoll about multiple independent origins of multicellularity. And in astrobiology, we're interested in the question, well, what should we expect elsewhere? And so these scientists are collecting examples of convergence using the logic that, oh, if it happened multiple times independently on Earth, then that's a good candidate for uh, what should happen elsewhere. Now, do you subscribe to that uh, logic? I, I don't know. I mean, we could talk about convergence, but the... The reality is that Earth is a, is a, we have a sample size of one. So, I mean, it depends on, you know, how we want to make these analogies of parts to holes and stuff. I thought Simon Conway Morris was a Christian and was using a convergence argument in order to argue that there's human-like life forms on other planets. Yes, yes. That, to me, doesn't seem to be supported by the evidence, as um, I s suggested before because we're only one of an estimated 10 to 30 million extant species, 99 plus percent of which are extinct. So it would seem to beg the question to think that um, life is in any way heading towards a human outcome. I mean, it makes more sense to think of maybe some sort of technological machinate, m mechanical using mammal or mechanical using organism would be, might be, arguably more common, but to think of uh, life in outer space the way they do on Star Trek and Star Wars as these human-like beings all over, it, it seems much more like um, kind of a comfortable projection than it does like sound scientific reasoning to me. 
Well, you, I think you're right that he's mo- uh, religiously motivated, but your dad talked about functionally equivalent humans and in, his, in his 1995 debate with Ernst Mayer. And, uh, and I've been very uncomfortable with that phrase, functionally equivalent humans, but he seemed to think that there were, I guess, functionally equivalent humans on these other planets. Do you share that belief? I don't know that, and I'm not sure what he means by functionally equivalent humans. You've never talked to him about that? No, I never, I never did hear that, and that's that sounds odd to me. Um, that's a phrase he used in the 1995. I think it was. And what does that mean? People uh, or, or uh, aliens that look like humans? No, but I think functionally equivalent humans. Mm-hmm. I think functionally equivalent organisms. Or I think organisms is a better way to say, say that. But what is the function of humans? And well, that's right. That's that's what I was going to ask you. I was hoping you could channel Carl, now your dad, and tell me. <laughs> Well, I mean, Max Tegmark, I think at MIT, has tried to calculate um, how far you would have to go in space, and he's actually come up with, you know, a number of miles to find an, not just another Earth or not just other humans, but an exact copy of exactly this. I mean, to, to reach That's not functionally equivalent. That's identical. <laughs> yeah, identical, yeah. So, I mean, somewhere before you get there, you would find lots of functionally equivalent, but... Um, to to uh, channel my mother again, you know, in in dissing the um, neo darwinists she used the phrase puerile numerologist. And puerile the, numerologist. Yeah, yeah, I know be. because when I gave a talk <laughs> and I put some statistics on the board, she fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, puerile numerologist. So okay. Well, All I right. mean, then you have. Um, but um, but wait a minute. Let's go back. Yeah, yeah, Functionally okay. equivalent. So yeah. I I have a hard time with it because I look at the you know there's never been an example of two species evolving independently anywhere on Earth. So and yet people say, oh no, there are, there's a for example kangaroos in Australia and mm-hmm. deer in North America, for example. They are the you know the grass eating niche. Mm-hmm. So the question is, is there a human like intelligence niche? Well, I mean, I think it's easier to argue that. It's easier to argue that a, the human beings are maladaptive because unlike successful long-term species, except in a couple of like wildly um, um, improbable, uh, um, magnificent exceptions like the ancestors to the mitochondria, the respiring bacteria, the alpha proteobacteria, and the ancestors to the green parts of plant cells, the plastids of algae, the, the cyanobacteria, organisms that reproduce exponentially end up at their limits and are often most populous in the fossil record and the generations immediately preceding their collapse. So um, I would say that um, human beings may not be functional and insofar as global warming is a reality, the fact that we have incrementally increased the temperature of the Earth looks to me like something you would see in an overheated laptop computer or um, a child with a fever. It's indicative of global thermodynamic dysfunction because if you look at these thermodynamic systems that seem to be the wider class of which life is a part, they are adept at reducing gradients and taking um, temperature and, um, and um, electron potential and um, these kinds of differences and forming regions of complexity that grow, but they don't last in the long term if they grow so fast that they destroy their own ability to reduce these differences. And insofar as the Earth is warming up because of human technology, that's an example of a possible um, um, global dysfunction. And it reminds me of something that may be of interest particularly to this topic, which is that both, both Stanislaw Lem and um, is it? Uh, you don't, no, I'm trying to remember the other person, but Stanislaw Lem, um, in thinking about the Fermi paradox, which is why we haven't discovered evidence of other aliens, made a very interesting um, suggestion, which is that they they don't. These other um, expansive technological civilizations aren't necessarily the ones that will be taking, uh, expanding as we are as a sort of colonial organism. A really a successful planetary civilization as part of a planetary ecosystem is not one which is on 
you know, a hell bent um, um, voyage or hell mission in order to spread everywhere because that goes along with the overpopulation that precedes ecological collapse. So maybe one of the reasons that we haven't seen other life forms is because they are living in ecologically sustainable rather than trying to expand as fast as they can. And, and that may also be associated with a sort of um, misunderstanding of human beings as we pat ourselves on the back as to the nature of what intelligence is. I mean, technology and intelligence are very impressive, but if they lead um, to overpopulation and climate collapse and ecological destruction, it's hard to argue that they are really intelligent. What is the definition of intelligence with regard to ecological sustainability? I think that's an important question. It sounds like you're channeling your mother rather than your father on this point. No, oh, well, I, I didn't remember who I was channeling. So. <laughs> you don't keep track of who you're channeling. Well, I've never heard your father in any of his no. writings talk so pessimistically about the future of no, man, I and rather that intelligence is an unmitigated no. good and self-awareness well, is... my father was a positivist and a humanist, and my mother was uh, an ecological thinker who often derided um, anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism, and I think in that sense she was uh, at the antipodes of my father philosophically. Did they argue about this point, do you know? Not that I can remember to the time that they split up when I was five. Uh, okay, <laughs> all right. In, now, <coughs> question, are we alone? Are we alone? Are we alone? I don't know. If that, can I give a Boolean answer? You can give whatever answer you want. Yes, no, and yes and no. Okay, and what are the what in the question, so those Boolean answers are because you're choosing different meanings for the word we? Well, I, I want to I wanna invoke quantum undecidability rather than answer that question with, yeah, I mean, who, who, who is we? Who is I, we in your yeah, mind? Who is I'll, we? If I, I mean, from a mystical standpoint, I am, I'm an open system and and just as we, as my mother, to channel her again, would say that um, viruses are not alive because they need the metabolism of the cell to, be ex to exist, that same argument can be used about cells and organisms on Earth, that they need the surface of the biosphere in order to exist, but then the biosphere needs the sun, as Bernowski would argue, and, that which, and, and why he used the term uh, Earth solar system rather than solar system in its descriptions of life. And of course, that only exists in the context of the whole. So if we really can't reduce, you know, in this kind of point, point by point thinking, which you might associate with a particle versus the wave and quantum mechanics, um, who, who the I is and who the we is to a single point, and really the only way that you can do it is to embrace the all, which is why I mentioned mysticism before, then we would both be alone because there's only one. And it's an illusion to think otherwise, but a very convincing one. No, wait, well, one biosphere, but but if there are other no, biospheres, no one. I mean, there's one be there's one being. Every being that exists, even on other planets, even on other planets. That would be my mystical. Answer, yeah. <coughs> That'd be your mystical one. Well, right. only, but I don't. But I'd only devote like up to about a hundred million, depending on what was left over after the philosophers stopped partying to that question. Mm. Okay. Um, it, so let me ask you again, are we alone? I don't think, I mean, I don't have, like I, like I said, um, mentioned before, the skeleton in a positive philosophy is solipsism. So I do not have direct internal phenomenological evidence of the existence of anybody else, you or any other person, even the people I'm closest to on the planet. Or even 95% of your own brain. Even 95, <laughs> well, okay. You're only conscious of a small part, right? Oh, okay. Isn't that what Freud told us? Yeah, well, I don't know, but, but um, I mean, I, so I don't know what I mean. It's a, it. I would, I would explore that. I would, I, I don't want to explore that question with a yes or no answer because to me it's a more subtle question and deserves like a more contemplative. But it'd be more fun to just, you know, to explore that in sort of a conviction or some other way. But I think I'd be cheapening the question by giving a yes or no answer. Okay, but can let's I, suppose that... Can you give me a multiple choice question? Well, let's say this. Uh, okay, the question is, are we alone? But I don't expect a uh, yes or no answer, yeah. but I would expect if you are unhappy with the phrasing, could you rephrase it? Okay, well, so you're, you're asking me, do I, in my, is my intuition that there are other 
intelligent beings that have separately evolved. So now you just changed we to intelligent beings. Now that's one way, or you could say we the life forms, or you could say we the far from equilibrium dissipative systems. You could redefine we as however you want. I don't want to define that for you. Well, I would say, okay, well, let me back up and say, and try to answer it in a less arcane manner and say just in terms of a common definitions or in terms of an expanded definition of life-like systems, I think there's many life-like systems to, we don't know, again, whether they experience the way that we experience. It makes us feel like we are really alive in the same way, the same sort of thing that Descartes um, disallowed the sort of uh, non-automatic uh, 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 behavior or non-automatic uh, non-automatism of animals. You know that they didn't really have souls. You wouldn't grant them that. But leaving aside that stuff, I would I would say that there's many complex systems in the universe, and that we are part of complex systems, and that the and that what we call life is has a, an element of the arbitrary to it because our life is connected to an environment which is not as unalive as we'd like to think. I like to pose and contrast um, Lovelock, James Lovelock's idea of the earth as having a physiology, the biosphere as being this complex system that at an extreme, which is um, uh, overly metaphorical, saying that earth is an organism, with Vladimir Vernadsky, who did the opposite and said, life is a moving mineral, and as a crystallographer in the Soviet Union, he looked at life as an animate form of water, as, a, as a, literally an impure form of water. And in both those cases, we can see the expansion of the idea of life in its relation to non-life. In the one case, you have Earth as a living being. In the other case, you have life as a form of mineral. And in both cases, you remove this magic word life, which I would argue is a form of latter-day animism. Because whenever you say life, you're labeling it, and then you're not really looking at the question as closely as you would as if, in contra, in, as you would if you looked at the actual processes. And when you look at the actual processes, you see these complex thermodynamic behaviors from flame to Baynard, uh, Baynard cells, Belosov-Zabotinsky reactions, chemical clocks, stars, these complex non-equilibrium systems, which say life, you know, what we call life in common language is a subsection of these broader class of complex systems. And they do behave in ways that have a, a complexity that's very close to what we think of intuitively as a cell. But they don't have a coding molecule. They don't have they, information no, inside them. No, they don't. But the coding molecule of DNA and RNA is like the, is like the lighter but the essence, from an energetic standpoint, is the flame. So there's a, so that's why I say that there are a larger class. Life is a specific class that has the coding molecule that allows the flame to continue burning through the coding molecule. So there's a continuum. I mean, there's a continuum in terms of the typology. There's also a continuum in terms of the connection to the rest of the universe, which is ultimately the minimal unit that you can use to describe this system that we want to wrap a little tidy word around and point to as ultimately different than everything else. And I'm not sure that that's philosophically coherent. What about the idea of the un we are a way in which the universe is becoming self-aware? That is a point that your father made over and over and over and over again. And I, for that reason, I sometimes have called him a brain worshiper. And uh, yeah. so, and uh, I'm not very sanguine about that, and, and yet many people are. For example, your friend David Grinspoon is somebody who subscribes to the idea that aren't we great, we are a way the universe is becoming self-aware, as if that is the most important feature of us. Well, um, I, I do think that that has become a bit of a cliche. I've heard that bandied about the internet and many times, and I, I, I think there's, there's some truth to it. It's, it's, a, it's a philosophical perspective. I do like um, the Estonian ethologist who, by the way, was the most mentioned scientist by the philosopher Martin Heidegger, Jacob von Huxkel's view of that in which he coined the word umwelt which is the living world, the perceptual world of beings, and not just human beings. So I wouldn't say that we, as humans, are the only way that the universe knows itself. I think, as he argued, 
um, all organisms in their vast variety that have many more forms of perception than we as humans do are experiencing um, the biosphere and the universe in different ways. So if you expand we to those 10 to 30 million extant species, I think that's a richer way of um, examining that we. And, it, and your question um, also makes me think of my mother's um, colleague and videographer, Jim McAllister, who made a very simple point that is a little bit off track, but he used it in a contrast to this same sort of cliche of we are the way that the universe knows itself by talking about the beings that we incorporate. So evolutionarily, we're, we're now becoming aware of the microbiota, of the, um, of the um, influence of the microbiota on moods, the, these other organisms that are within us and the organisms of which we are a part fall into this Oxwellian panorama of sentient beings on the surface of the earth. And um, what's fascinating there is that I would want to say and, and argue that it's a richer than to think that I am just the universe being channeled as a, as a sort of like an eye, a floating eye, an Emersonian eye floating in the sky and perceiving everything, but I'm also a kind of a group life form whose own perception, whose sense of I is really a shorthand for hundreds of millions and billions and actually trillions of interacting organisms, both in real time as cells that are not part of my body and the cells that are quote unquote part of my animal body that themselves have multiple lineages so that when I get thirsty or when, you know, they, he says, talks about taking out the garbage or there's different <laughs> there's different sensations that you have that are actually um, really shorthand for your you being a corporate and in an incorporation of many 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 life forms okay so well, in other words it's not just the universe without that we is knowing itself but it's also our inner universe of microbes that is an expression of who we are and that that is equally if not more fascinating in the sense that there's more to study there from a pragmatic scientific standpoint. What you just described, do you think that would be a description of life on other planets? Is there anything universal about what you described? Often people say, hey, Darwinism is universal, therefore we should expect, you know, variation selection, hey, it's going to happen out there as well. But what you just described is not exactly Darwinism, it's a I guess it's a, a way in which, I guess it's more like endosymbiosis and being part of whole, larger things. Now is that... Well, 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 I think that was what I talked about was, it was Darwinian, it was Darwinian phenomenology. It was like, instead of looking at ourselves as sort of a classical kind of humanist vector for the universe, which has kind of, it, it, it smacks up sort of a theistic universe, though it is humanist, why not... Um, why not um, consider that evolutionary reality, like you say, emphasizing symbiosis, but also the phenomenology of non-human life forms. By phenomenology, I mean the actual experience of other beings within us and of which we are a part. And I think that, in a way, is a richer sort of um, tree to bark up. Well, I agree, but can we bark up that tree on other planets? Well, I mean, if we find life on other planets, we don't know if there is life on other planets. We don't, but imagine that there is. Do you think yeah. there's anything universal about this, the richness of looking inside and seeing multiple layers like a Matryoshka doll? Yeah, I would, I would, I mean, intuitively, I would think that that would be, if, for example, panspermic models are right, that life evolves on different planets, um, not, I mean, not that life evolves on other planets, but it spreads and is therefore not um, uncommon through the solar system. I mean, this is pure speculation. Like I said before, exobiology, astrobiology is a science without a subject. Well, if, unless say, you define life such that we've okay. already found it, which well, is all, we're almost there. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, but let's say that let's say that there are that that, that there are um, bacterial spores and they are being trans that they are being transported inside meteorites and that you have bacteria routinely evolving or in planets that it has arrived on, then I think under the right conditions you would get these um, nested systems 
in which um, a sense of, an inner sense of being alive expands into different forms as the forms become more um, concentrated and diversify into each other's bodies and beings. So if, I mean, that's just, you know, it's an intuitive answer to a speculative question, but that seems well, to be Well, I'm, what I'm trying to do is get your opinion on the universality of endosymbiosis. If there's life, will you have endosymbiosis? Well, I mean, that, that's, again, that's like pure speculation. We only have one example. We have endosymbiosis. It's very rich. I think it's much, it's still much more richer and yep. much more rich and important for the evolutionary process on Earth than it's being given credit. And, even you, have, with the, and like, you have multiple well, examples of it at multiple yeah, levels. So if you so, want to use the Simon Conway Morris, um, et cetera, convergence argument, then yes, that would be a well, valid. Well, well, I would argue that the independent examples of endosymbiosis are much more independent of each other than the ones about the eyeball that is used, for example. Okay, is the question, are we alone, an important one? Who cares? I mean, those, <laughs> we're talking about the universality of, or the potential universality of endosymbiosis and the independent examples of it being more independent than the examples that Conway Morris has talked about. Do you agree with that? I don't know what you mean by independent examples of symbiosis versus. Well, for example, multi well, of well, for example, there's chloroplasts and there's uh, mitochondria and there's also the multiple uh, endosymbiosis involved with algae. I mean, there was a. a, a chloroplast inside an algae, which then became endosymbiotically incorporated in another algae, mm -hmm. I think multiple times. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I mean. But the eye also evolved multiple times, like the ocellus. Well, the, you know. I, I, I would disagree with that because the biochemistry of that is very similar. Okay. But anyway, let's move on to the question. Is the question, are we alone, important? Is this a bunch of philosophers sitting around at a bar speculating about something useless? Or should we be doing this? Should we, should we be even thinking about this question? I think, it's a, I think it's a useful question to help focus different forms of science and to bring science in connection with philosophy. I also think it's an almost unavoidable question in the decline of monotheistic religion. I characterize the search for extraterrestrial intelligence as a replacement for religion in a secular age. So in that sense, and as you can see in mass media and the TV shows and the continuing interest in the science fiction of aliens, um, that this is something that people naturally gravitate to. It seems to be a kind of justification of existence that we can't quite find, which makes it a sort of existential challenge. Okay. Um, I'm not getting, can you say something louder? Say hello, hello. Hello, hello. Okay, I'm not, can your, is your button there green? Can you show me that? Yes, it is. That should be. That's okay. That's okay here. So why am I not getting coming through here? Is it, uh, okay. say hello, hello. Hello, hello. Oh, why is that not, well, we'll just have to go with the other sound. It's not coming through the one, ah, there it is. Okay. There it is. This thing. I need to tape that there. All right. All right back okay. in business. All right. Very good. Um, so you were saying that you're saying that this is an important question because it replaces religion. Is that what you just said? I say it's an unavoidable question because with the decline of monotheism and of the the the, the kind of um, relative theological relativism and people's realizations that you know, for one thing, when you look up and to where heaven was supposed to be in the Middle Ages, you don't see God or angels, you see stars and planets. Um, that The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a replacement for religion in a secular age. So it has a sort of religious, unintentional religious dimension. People want to find meaning by finding others. So looking for God. Looking for God. Do you think and, your father was looking for God? Well, I, I think that um, if you look at the movie Contact um, and um, the way after all of this search um, for uh, life with other beings in distant galaxies, you wind up with your family on the beach and the aliens sort of talking through the family, that there's a sense in which the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, in, my, in the case of my father, was a... Uh, a way to come back to um, 
constant search for contact with other human beings on the Earth. But know? Jodie Foster was lucky that she got in that spaceship. She was an atheist. How could she represent America to go into this time <laughs> machine, right? That was an interesting part of that story. Okay, uh, does uh, knowing the big picture of life on Earth help you be a better person? I think knowing the big picture on life on Earth is, is, is very, has a, a great philosophical consolation. And I would, I would ally myself with my limited understanding of uh, Baruch Spinoza in that, um, in that respect. Spinoza talked about um, knowledge for its own sake. And although he was questioned free will, his idea of freedom was about, in part, um, knowing the, the absolute value of knowing for its own sake, not in order to do something, but in order for its own, uh, its, its own value. And I like to call that um, the Curie criterion after Madame Curie, who's the only person who won two uh, Nobel Prizes in the sciences, in physics and chemistry, I believe. She said, nothing in life is to be feared, only understood. So I think when you're a, a human being, you know, you're living in a particular century um, after billions of years of uh, evolutionary history, about four billion on the earth and about 13 billion in the universe. And this so much has happened. It's, it's crazy now, but you see how it's been crazy before. It's actually, uh, a, a deep, and I don't want to say philosophical consolation because that has a negative connotation as, you know, it's only philosophical consolation, but I think it's, um, it's a very rich form of sort of Spinozistic self-knowledge and it helps um, us get over our sort of, um, to be evolutionarily reductionist, our sort of like post-mammalian fear syndrome I and mean, having evolved from like little arboreal um, mammals and then uh, and then primates and organisms that came out of the um the the nocturnal lifestyle after the end of the um the final extinctions of the dinosaurs in the cretaceous period we still we're still very social animals and we consider ourselves very superior because we have you know opposable thumbs and iphones and brains and technology and and stuff, but really, you know, we carry on this heritage of being scared little mammals, and 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 now we're looking at scared little mammals not just in a forest, but in this vast universe. And to see the whole picture is is actually um, it provides a sort of uh, intellectual bomb that I think is you don't really get anywhere else. That's a B A L M or B O M B. <laughs> B A L B A L B A L. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, in the, in the Drake equation, we astronomers think we've made lots of progress in finding these Earth-like planets around other stars, and, and yet the the other terms, the the uh, biological terms in the Drake equation, I'm not sure any progress has been made. And that is, what fraction of these Earth-like planets will have life, and what fraction of the life will have intelligent life mm -hmm. that will make technology and mm -hmm. etc. So. Is there any way you can approach those two terms in the Drake equation, or the three ones, the, the lifetime of this, the communicative civilization? Can you approach that as a philosopher, or how would one make progress on those three terms? Well, I mean, the Drake equation is a, it's a, it's a, it's a typical mathematization of something that doesn't lend itself to you know, discrete mathematical solutions. Like you say, any, any term any term in the Drake equation is zero, then the answer is zero. We don't know if two or three of the um, factors are not zero, so we still don't have any idea. And life is, uh, as I said before, you know, we have one example of life. It's it's a biosphere. We don't know of any others. And so we're really sort of grasping in the dark. And life itself is uh, its not a repeatable experiment until we find another. So, I mean, if we found another life form, another um, biosphere or, or um, another intelligent or even unintelligent life form, that would give us um, a kind of uh, 
parallax or binocular vision, we'd have something to compare it with, which we don't have right now, which is part of the problem of, the, of astrobiology and exobiology, and I guess also part of the tantal, tantalizing nature of the question, are we alone? I think, you know, what one uh, somewhat like science fiction-y, but also futurologically possible um, avenue that hasn't been that much talked about to address the question is to put life to have, to engineer, or to, to see what happens if you had a, a, a working biosphere um, either in space, you know, a space station that was completely recycling, or you used um, the recycling technology, I would say technology in quotes, because the technology is really that ancient high technology of co living life forms that are able to recycle our surroundings, which we still can't do, and let alone at room ten temperature in the elegant way that life has already evolved. If you could have another biosphere that was up and running, then you know you might be able to uh, make more generalizations about you know what the possibilities of other life is. Of course, that would be cheating in a sense because you're not you're finding a life that you put there where life is growing there, if that makes sense. So what is your favorite solution to the Fermi's Paradox? My favorite solution is the one that I mentioned earlier, that there may well be many, many um, biospheres out there, but they're not in their colonial expansion phase because that's inherently self-limiting. And so that they, so that just because you don't see them there doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means they're not on on a rampage to like take over the universe because they've learned long ago that you have to be more zen if you're going to be like you have a to be more zen. Zen, yeah. You, you know, you have to just calm down and live within your means and not try and you know. I mean, they they might look at Earth as a pathologic as in a phase of pathological technological growth that will calm down and then maybe you know few species after humans go extinct, it might be time to make contact. So, so you would agree with the German, I think he was a scientist, maybe a philosopher, who Carl Schroeder, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said any sufficiently advanced yeah, civilization indistinguishable would be, from magic. Was, is, be indistinguishable from magic, but Carl Schroeder said, no, no, you're wrong, Arthur, any sufficiently advanced civilization will be, in, will be indistinguishable from nature. Yeah, I like that. Like that, but nature is also kind of magical. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. What kind of aliens would you like to find? I, I just don't want to find any more like hairy anthropoids in outer space. You don't. I don't. A lot of young men want to have sex with <laughs> sexy aliens in the movies. Hollywood is always well, putting sexy okay, aliens well, in there. Have, you're forcing me to reconsider here. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Well, a lot of young men. I mean want uh, sexy aliens they can have sex with and then a lot of academics want uh, want wise godlike aliens to answer all their oh, questions answer, yeah. and uh, I'm just wondering what your emotional attachment to aliens might be and is it to uh, any well I think there's, there's there there could be al there we have a we have an, uh, an amazing richness of local life forms so you don't need any more than Earth life. You're satisfied with what we have. I mean, I'm ha I'm happy. I'm open to the possibility of more of another, you know, ten to thirty million species that are on the cusp of uh, multi-billion-year right. evolution. Now, Peter Singer and others uh -huh. uh, think that uh, human rights should be extended to any sentient creatures. And so is it, the idea is that uh, I guess if you're sentient, you have rights, and if you're not sentient, you don't. And so that leads me to think, oh, the more sentient you are, the more valuable. It reminds me of eugenics somehow. But yeah. instead of eugenics, it's you sentience. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, so I'm wondering, and also when, when I hear this idea of we are the, the universe's way to become self-aware, I said, right. oh, too bad our brain's not a billion times bigger, then we'd be really good. Now, so it's kind of like, I guess, brain chauvinism. Do you, what, what is your view on that set of issues? Well, you know, I, in 2002, I co-taught a course with my mom in Danville, Kentucky, at Central College called Life and Literature. And it was, you know, it's, it, it was in the near south. And um, she asked vis-a-vis um, -vis the question of abortion 
if people thought, you know, fertilized egg was alive and everybody's hands shut up and then she, she talked about like spraying Lysol on your kitchen counter and microbes and whether they were alive and people didn't want to believe that they were alive because then you would be killing something that was living. Yes. I think it's, this is actually a deep question of ethics and verges on some serious disturbing existential philosophy and it's not and, and I don't think that there are there are acceptable cavalier answers or prescriptions as to you know which uh, beings should be granted rights the whole question of rights is something else that you know political philosophers are probably better able uh, to talk about but I think of um, Emmanuel Levinas who was uh, uh, a, a rabbi and a philosopher, and he talked about how you really, he's actually a, another case of the problem as well as um, a potential answer. He talked about how you need to, to be before the face of the other being, and you can't have like, you know, a sort of Ten Commandments or prescriptive ethics. You have to work out ethical problems in the actual interaction and there's no you know like you were uh, alluding to before with finding this godlike aliens that can give us all a set of answers there is no set of answers you have to go through it on a case by case basis but apparently he had a dog in Auschwitz and he didn't even consider his dog to have a face because what Levinas wanted to do was to say that it's the interaction with the face of the other so there was a theological element in there so if it didn't have a face then it wasn't a sentient being, so therefore it didn't have, you didn't actually have to worry about it. And you can see... Good thing he's not a drone operator. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, it's, it's directly related to peer review, dropping bombs on people that you don't see, and not seeing the face of the other, and not having that sort of responsibility from... I wanted to use this sort of theoretical rubric to argue for the face of the earth, but then I found out, through talking to a philosopher friend, that he didn't even grant the term face to his own dog hmm. in Auschwitz. So, I mean, it's an infinitely complicated problem, and I think everybody um, deals with it in, in different ways. It's alluded to in the term naked lunch in the William Burroughs book, where you realize that what's on the end of your fork was actually a sentient being. At one point, you know, you have people who, you know, the Jainists will cover their cover their mouths with that so they don't unintentionally inhale and therefore kill insects. But I mean, insofar as you are a being on a planet that, as Nietzsche described, it runs on a sort of self-murderousness, you are culpable and there's really no way around it. Um, I, I locate the problem um, evolutionarily, potentially, with the origin of the Ediacara, who even though they may not have been animals, um, were the first beings to concentrate sense organs at one end of their body, and so therefore we can argue that they were the first ones mm -hmm. with heads, and so they they were potentially the first beings to recognize that in their feeding operations they were inflicting pain on other beings. So this is like an ancient problem, and the answer to it isn't really an answer, it's a form of denial, which in philosophy I would argue is called act of forgetting, where you do inflict pain but you can't accept that you're inflicting pain so you ratchet it up and then you also look at the line of you know inclusion of beings with rights over times and there doesn't seem to be any prescription there either it, it keeps on including more and more and so that there are people ethical philosophers are saying that you know Mars as an inanimate object deserves the right not to be colonized by life forms and I don't think I you know, following Levinas here again, I don't think there's any easy answer there. Okay, how about, uh, is there an easy answer to the question about whether we should or should not broadcast our existence to outer space? Stephen Hawking thinks we should keep our head down, and I think he believes that because based on what uh, Europeans have done to other right. peoples. And so, <coughs> excuse me, what are, your, what are your view on whether we should or should not broadcast our existence uh, explicitly to. Uh, well, I think Stephen Hawking is wrong about that, and Michio, and I think it's silly. Uh, um, and uh, Michio Kaku did something too, saying that it would be like uh, it would be like Vietnam. They're both using these like human experiential metaphors and projecting them onto space, which is an old problem in exo 
Now, well, what should we project onto space, well, I, if not well, ourselves? The reason I say it's silly is because, I mean, specifically Hawking was talking about the fact that if we advertise our existence insofar as we look for life, we might attack, or we might attract a voracious alien who will come and devour the Earth. And to me that sounds ridiculous. It sounds as ridiculous as somebody uh, flying to Morocco to eat a garbanzo bean. Because if you have aliens that could recognize us, they would probably already be able to synthesize their um, matter that they needed to eat, assuming that they eat as heterotrophs on the planet Earth um, do, um, and have absolutely no need. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's it, to me, it's, it just smacks of another example of projecting our very local experience onto the entire universe at large, and I don't, I, w I wouldn't worry about it. I think it's fine. Go broadcast it. I mean, we're broadcasting our existence anyway, you know, through having our own uh, electronic communication. So it's not a question of should we or shouldn't we. We are. It's just what's the quality. Okay, in the last scene in the movie Contact, Jodie Foster is talking to a child, and the child says, are, are we alone? And she, and she says back to him, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Well, um, who was it? Um, um, you might, you will know the, um, who the famous, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember, Eddington. I think it was Arthur Eddington, who's an astronomer, right? And a, and a science writer. And I believe it was him who said, um, as a sort of anti-theological argument, an argument against God that, you know, if there's a God, he produced light and gravity and all these things that are spread out everywhere, but the only place we find life is on Earth. So he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to find life. So yeah, it is, it does seem you mean like- he wasn't trying to make life? He wasn't trying, if he was, if he was, so, if he was really, if the universe is about making life, why not make it as um, widespread as, as electromagnetic radiation? Well, maybe it is, and we just haven't found it yet. Yeah. Um, so what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you the other question about the movie. Uh, when Jodie Foster gets these signals, she starts to show these blueprints to the military, and the military says, oh, don't, do, you don't even think about building that, because if you build it, it will, you know, destroy us, as if, Aliens are uh, going to cr the only reason why an alien civilization would produce a message would be to, I don't know, send it like a meme and then take over and kill and uh, mm -hmm. kill the people who uh, can understand it. So uh, you're not that type of paranoid, are you? No, I'm not. I'm not that type of paranoid. And like I said, my, the and the Stanislaw Lem and May. I think it was also E. O. Wilson. I found it interesting that they both offered without specifically addressing it as an answer to the Fermi paradox, the notion that, you know, mature life forms on a biosphere may not be in a rampant growth phase. So, um, I mean, if we keep that close to heart, then, you know, the, the experience of militaristic spreading, um, killing human civilization, that whose population, by the way, has doubled, more than doubled since the time I was born, and I calculated that despite um, um, dismissals of worries over population growth, at that rate of increase in 2,000 years, there will be not trillions, 4,016 AD, not trillions, there'll be quadrillions of people then you're going to really have to look for life down there because the only way you're going to have room is for people being living inside each other at the nano scale. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not going to work. Uh, I mean, it's, it defies the imagination, and yet that seems to be part of like the economic logic of modern humanity, and it's tied up with this idea of, uh, of um, militar militaristic expansionism. So, I mean. I mean, not that there isn't something very, very natural about exponential reproduction that we see in human beings, but also 
uh, the opposite is also the case. You have to be able to use energy, which tends to spread as formalized by the second law of thermodynamics, but also to continue the complex system which is using the energy. So both are important, both the expansion but also the, the resistance of the expansion in order not to destroy the system that is metabolizing. And I think that you could argue that mature civilizations are, have learned, and even also as your, as your quote about um, a sufficiently advanced civilization is indistinguishable from nature, that we are living among um, ecosystems that have already solve this problem. The problem that we're wrestling with at a global scale has already been solved locally by um, sustainable ecosystems. And as I, um, as second author, uh, have written um, in this new book, um, Cracking the Aging Code, with Josh Middledorf, who was uh, 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 has a PhD in physics, he studied astrophysics, but got interested in aging. What looks like to be the best evidence for why we age is not that it's just natural wear and tear and not that we take the energy that is used for maintenance and, um, and, and become unable to marshal that when we reproduce. And it's not even that the genes that we use that keep us um, vigorous and virile and fertile when we're young turn against us when we're old, but that organisms and clades with a tendency to grow too fast are endangering themselves evolutionarily um, if they um, reach their um, exponential uh, tendencies. And so nature has, at a group selection level, abated that very dangerous tendency of expansionist growth by incorporating aging into the genes and epigenetically. So this would suggest that we've already evolution has already figured out stuff that is elusive to human beings and that our embracement of growth on both the political left and the political right is counter natural in a fundamental sense insofar as aging is natural in um, a phyla that have had a tendency especially to grow too fast there are some animals where there is no sign of aging in the statistical sense of being more likely to die next year than this year and you can um, take fruit flies and, um, and breed for their longevity and they become no less fertile and they can live eight times as long. You can knock genes out of nematodes and make them live ten times as long. So there does seem to be some very strong, very advanced, very magical but natural seeming mechanisms, if you like, in nature that have evolved to keep ecosystems stable. And right now, we don't. when you look at human beings and the evidence for global warming and global thermodynamic dysfunction, um, we do not seem to fit into that category of a mature civilization. Harriet Tubman in the Civil War said, uh, at, they asked her, how many did you, slaves did you save? And she said, I could have saved a thousand more if they'd known they were slaves. And that reason I'm quoting that is because I think the reason why I'm doing astrobiology is to find out who I am. To, I guess I have an identity crisis and I want to know, and usually I find out by traveling around. I found out I was an American by leaving America, and I guess we'll find out that we're Earthlings by leaving the Earth or finding other living beings. Is that what motivates you as well? An identity crisis? Motivates me to what? To, to think about these questions, about astrobiology, about into the cool, what is life, far from equilibrium, how do you fit into the universe here? I, I kind of, um, I didn't choose to become a science writer. It was foisted upon me by local astrobiological powers. But <laughs> <laughs> and those powers that have names? Well, I mean, I, I, I am interested in exploring, I'm interested in art, I, I consider myself uh, to be an artist or a poet stuck in the body of a science writer, so I'm making do with what <laughs> nature gave me to pursue my interest. So I wouldn't, I think, I think we're on a similar page. I just, I would probably stay away from the, the, the psychologistic term of identity crisis in my case, but it might be a premature uh, disavowal. Okay, have you ever seen a UFO? 
Um, actually, I was with. Well, this I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can put this on. Turn off the. <laughs> <laughs> I can always cut it out. But... No, well, I was. Um, I went to the Telluride Film Festival. Until, not the Telluride Film Festival. The Telluride Mushroom Festival in Colorado. And I was actually with David Grinspoon. I was with my son, and I was with my mother. She gave a talk. I gave a little um, magic show, um, a mushroom magic show. But um, they gave their speakers um, some Salasabis Cubensis, to use the um, Latin name. And um, at one point, I looked up in the mountains of Colorado, and I saw these red lights. And my son and his friend were there. I said, what is that? Is that a UFO? And he goes, no, Dad, that's the lights from the ski lift. David Grinspoon would kill you right now. Or something. <laughs> so you something like that. Yeah. So, you, so you had the, a, a drug-induced uh, yeah. illusion. A drug, yeah, a drug-induced uh, um, vision. Vision of uh, potential UFOs. Nice. In it was it was unidentified for a while until your yeah. son told you yeah. the ski lift light. <laughs> okay. So let me uh, let me ask one more time okay. to the question: Are we alone? I don't think I don't feel alone right now okay. but I'm not but that doesn't mean that I'm I didn't say are you alone I said are we alone yeah and you can are we alone we. that's almost like a cone isn't it you say it enough times it's yeah, it is. Well, are we it alone yeah, yes actually it, it's self-negating question isn't it because the we is already suggesting that we're not that's, that's so it's right. a trick question no, it's, Very well clever. it depends on what the unit that we is for what but, we uh, is. So now and alone. Thinking. What is alone? How, I asked it a three-year-old yesterday, yeah. and she said, "No, I'm not alone. I have a family." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, everybody's got a different answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to stay with the question too. Hmm. All right. So, uh, are we alone? I don't know. You don't know. Is there any way we, what we can do as scientists to find out? Do you have any recommendations from the philosophical corner of this debate? I don't. I, I think I've exhausted my philosophical scientific um, barrel of <laughs> answers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right.